Welcome to On the Table, a podcast about board games, card games, and tabletop war games. Welcome back to episode 103 of the On the Table Gaming Podcast. I'm Chase, and today we're going to be talking about getting started with the Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. Now, this game has been out for a while now, and it's got a big and growing fan base. But with the new 2021 update, this is a great time to either return to the game or jump in again. And so we brought on some some experts to uh, help us navigate. You know, if you're just getting started or you're coming back and you want to pick a faction or you want to have some tips on, on getting your miniatures painted up and really kind of leveling up your experience, what might we want to keep in mind? So today I'm joined by Duncan Rhodes from the Duncan Rhodes Painting Academy. And Duncan, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, Chase. And we're also joined by this tag team here with Fabio Curry, the lead game designer for uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. So Fabio, thanks for coming on. Hey, Chase. It's great being here as well. I feel like we just spoke and this is, uh, here we are again here. And then, and then of course, we've got the lead game designer for uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. Uh, people that you, if you're a Song of Ice and Fire miniatures game player, of course, course you know and maybe you played his other games like bloodborne as well uh, michael chanel michael thanks so much for coming on hello chase good to be back so you know we've got this amazing war game and i think one of the things that we all share and all have in common is our absolute love for this game and you know we maybe come at it from different sorts of ways you know what initially and i know we've talked about this a little bit in the past on, on past episodes duncan but maybe what initially drew you to a song of ice and fire the miniatures game i know you play a lot of games what about a song of ice and fire kind of sparked your interest yeah i i I've, um, I've played quite a few different games, but for, for this one, what initially um, what I saw was um, I was at a gaming show and there was some demo tables set up. And I could see in the distance the silhouette of banners and halberds, which drew my attention. So I managed to get a quick look and it was all ranked up and things. But the, the general appearance of it, I think, the visually is what got me interested because these, um, the, the lanterns in particular, just looked really cool to me. And it really stood out. And so I kind of decided um, to investigate a bit further. I looked at some stuff online and then I managed to find a core box set and I bought it and uh, started getting all the figures out and stuff. And I just thought the, they just looked great. It Visually, it really appeals to me. And then as I started learning more about it more things kind of started kind of ticking boxes for me the array of the armies when they're laid out they look really nice having it all ranked up all neatly kind of gives you that feel of seeing the medieval armies and things on tv shows and things especially seeing all the flags you know waving above them and things and then seeing what the size of an army is is great because when you're working on it as a project it's an achievable target to hit that army and have it all painted um, then when you see how the game works you realize you're involved in it all the way through and it's very dynamic and it has that flavor of ice and fire with the politics with your tactical board these things just kept on like sort of well i say ticking boxes for me so i just got into it more and more and more and uh discovered that i actually just really enjoy playing it so <laughs> it's um there's very few games for which i'll go to tournaments regularly but this is one that's fantastic and in fact actually i think there's coming up there's the uk grand tournament is that something you're going to be partaking in yes it is i uh, i bought my ticket just yesterday uh i've not decided what army i'm going to take yet but if you're in the uk and you want to come and have a battle come and fight me it's so, uh, uk gt <laughs> it's the one in london um it's in hmm. september 25th 26th of september i think it is um though yeah all the information's online fantastic all right and uh you know we look forward to hearing what you're going to run what what faction you're going to settle <laughs> with here you've got a lot of beautifully painted miniatures so I, I feel like you've got uh you've got some options yes yeah there's plenty of choices i've got some ideas though and the update rules has got kind of sparked some thoughts and things i'm kind of thinking lannister but maybe because you take two army lists i'm thinking of like one being the army of the the rightful king joffrey and the other one possibly being the Faith Militant and just seeing, you know, two completely different sorts of sub-factions in the main faction. So we'll see. We'll see anyway. It's still a work in progress. Absolutely fantastic. And, you know, Michael, we, we've talked a few times on the podcast and, you know, you've been working on this project for a long time. I mean, I think the Kickstarter goes back to you know, 2017. When you originally designed the game, what, what did you hope to capture with the actual design of the game? Like, what sort of feeling did you want to evoke? What was your goal when you set out to create this? Well, one of the main purposes was to uh, modernize the rank and file war game. That was really uh, going through a period is that, you know, you had larger scale games that have existed, you know, forever, but just the market was moving toward people don't have time for four or five hour games. They don't have time for, you know, all these giant things. And frankly, there's just a lot of uh, what I feel was a bloat just kind of happening because just in general, the way games were going is that people don't have time to dissect through huge rule books and everything. And you saw this trend in video games and online games and tabletop games as well. So one of the main things was really just trying to modernize that experience to still keep that um 
big tabletop war game feel, but just streamline it to the point where you could actually like play a game very quickly, but still get that same experience. And then, of course, the visuals behind it was were very important because we were dealing with an IP. So the first and foremost thing was making sure that we were capturing the essence of the setting and, you know, George Martin's books and everything to make sure that that was accurately rep- represented. Fantastic. And, you know, if you're a longtime listener to the show, you know a lot about A Song of Ice and Fire probably already. Uh, if this is your first time checking it out, we just had a new update come out, the 2021 update. And so this is a game that is got a really great core chassis. You know, over the past couple of years, you guys have slowly worked on some elements and you made some some polishing up to have just slight changes here to set us up for this big 2021 update. So, Fabio, what, what was the biggest takeaway that, you know, uh, maybe returning players might want to have in mind about the, uh, the 2021 update? Like, what should they know coming back into it? Well, I'd say the first thing is that there's not really much catching up to do because the main rules haven't changed. So we basically changed game modes and all of the faction unit and tactics cards and attachments. So all you really need to do if you're a returning player is pick up the models you already have, um, check the app and start playing again. And you'll notice that it really feels as the same game. And just some quality of life adjustments have been done across the board. So when we say 2021 changes and people listen that we changed everything, it, it's an everything with uh, an asterisk. Right. <laughs> and it really should feel the same. And if you fell in love with the game as I did before I started working at Simon because of the models and just the amazing heraldry that's depicted there as well and the table presence of the game, then you don't have anything to worry about. I mean, we still maintain that most of the unit roles all stayed the same. It was more so just a streamlining of what they did, effect names, triggers, things like that, and just, you know, handling things like that. So, you know, like you have a, a unit of Lannister Guardsmen, they still do the same function that Lannister Guardsmen have always done. Stark sworn towards the same thing. They just either do it more efficient or just the text on there was cleaned up so that, you know, it was a little less ambiguous and just got a general pass in that regard. And so, you know, it's a great time uh, if you're also jumping in and you want to get started. Um, this is a great time to start picking up miniatures and start collecting a Song of Ice and Fire the Miniatures game. Now, Duncan, when you when you first got into it, did you uh, how did how did you get started? You picked up the the Starks first Lannister starter set. Yeah, that's right. I just picked up the, the core box because um, I mean, whilst there was a whole bunch of things there, the if you're going to start out a game, you start with a core game, right? And this was quite a while back where, before all the newer factions had started appearing. So I think you could get Night's Watch and Free Folk at the time. I think they just come out. But anyway, I picked up the core set. And that really has everything you need to start playing. And whilst obviously the rules have updated now and these things are all free online, the, the thing then, it was all set and ready to go. So I was able to get everything out and just start playing it there. Um, me being the way I am, I kind of had to paint everything before I started playing with it. Um, I, it if I don't, I imagine if I played with the game publicly, I'd cause great offense to people standing around people me. Or something people like must that. love playing with you, though, then. You always show up with like beautifully painted miniatures and it's like, all right, I'll play against that. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually, because um, uh, uh, whereabouts I was, I, I didn't really know anyone else who played it. So I just found myself painting everything. So I painted both the Starks and the Lannisters. Again, two solid Stark armies to begin with. And all these kind of starter sets, like the bigger starter game and the individual faction starter boxes, they do come well ready prepared with a, a balanced army that's set to go, which you can customize as much as you want. But it's like it's a nice collection of things. Um, so you get a taste of how the faction works and you get some different flavors in there. Um, so yeah, I just did everything. I, I I just sort of set it all up. I built some 3D scenery. I got it on my gaming table. I invited a friend over and we just had a game of it. And we were like, this is brilliant. This is really, really good. And so he started coming over regularly just to play these games. And he'd use the Starks, I'd use the Lannisters. And then I started showing it to more and more people. Um, then I found out my local gaming store was doing some gaming nights of it. So I started going there and I started playing against a guy who'd done a Tully-themed army. Um, and yeah, I just found um, it was it was addictive. It was very easy to get this initial starting points done and then just add to it because the armies, they're not, um, I, I think one of the really clever bits about it is that these armies are achievable goals. You don't need to paint hundreds of figures if you want to have a fully painted army here. The average army seems to be around about 50 figures. And so that's a solid target for you to go for. Each unit is a, an achievable finished point, which you can then expand a little bit once you hit that core army, it's very easy to start swapping units in and out and adding extra things. So it's just really nicely designed if you're looking to get into it, just to pick up one of these starter sets, paint everything there, you're ready to go. And that's basically what I did. And 
I have since then started buying all the starter sets and been painting them all one at a time. <laughs> I just love these box sets. They're great. That starter set, you know, two-player starter set, such a great purchase to get because you get a ton of miniatures in there. Mm-hmm. And then the rules are so quick when, when you, like you, you invited someone over. It's so easy to teach this game. And, you know, you can do a demo game and then they can really, like, understand it and get into playing it. And so, like, it kind of, like, fast tracks the, the fun part. Like, you know, the parts of the game you want to be playing. It's like, I want, I want to play. And so you can like yeah. jump right into it. Yeah, absolutely. That's the great thing about the color plastic because it does kind of give you the green light to um, just start playing with the figures. You know, just to, to get them out and get going. I just, uh, I, I, for me, I feel, I, I just feel like I've got to paint them. I don't, you have I, a little bit of reputation, I'll, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. You know, Duncan Rhodes Painting Academy, and it's like you know people want to see the <laughs> the paint here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was joking with a other fellow. I should rock up to this uh, this grand tournament with uh, an unpainted army and just see what happens. Oh my god, that's how you go like incognito. <laughs> people be like, that, that's not the real Duncan Rhodes. Yeah, go ahead. It's one of those like fake glasses with a fake nose and mustache and stuff. <laughs> There's your <laughs> next. Next year's April Fool's Day joke: How to get a Song of Ice and Fire the miniatures game from the box to being able to put on the table? Just take the miniature, <laughs> put it down, and be like, "I'm good. I, I, it's on there." <laughs> well, I think actually that would make for an interesting uh, thing. I, with our with the website I'm working with Roger, we um, we focus on showing how to paint these individual miniatures and things. But I often thought, you know, what would a project be like if we were to film? How do you get one of these sets ready for action as quick as possible? It might be an interesting project to do there. But they're, I agree. they're, they're great achievable goals, and they're all wonderful sets. Each one of these boxes is great each one of these factions has a distinct flavor and i would say for someone just looking at it and seeing all these factions um i've seen a lot of people like, assuming you have to buy the big stark first lannister starter box to be able to get going and you don't each army's got its own starter where you go for that and you're ready to go with that faction got everything you need well, except for the neutrals i suppose are a bit different but it's the same sort of general thing but the, the key thing i'd always recommend to anybody um is take a look at all the different factions all different miniatures and go for the one that you think looks coolest because you'll be the happiest with it then when you get it all out on the table uh, <laughs> uh, when you start um putting it all together when you start painting it um, when you start getting into it if you like the miniatures it draws you in so much more and um, so that would be my advice to anyone who's trying to work out which faction to go for michael and fabio so if someone is is listening to the, this advice they're like yeah okay i can just pick up a starter set but like which one should i get we are now at a point we have what nine factions available the fabled nine factions maybe could we maybe talk a little about what's the general faction identity just quickly going through you know what do they play like um, what's the general idea behind them and then maybe like a notable commander or a unit that might catch someone's attention and maybe kind of just give an overview of you know what do they, what are the different factions what are the different options and how do they play so you know a lot of people have read the books or seen the show and you guys have really been true to the the ip but maybe some people don't even have that much experience with those elements what what does each faction play like so for example we started with house lannister uh, just you know in a you know kind of a brief summary form how would you describe house lannister's style of play i believe uh we should let fabio cover this because i actually have a very special criteria for each army i'm going to give you as far as what you should start with and what commander you should go with oh okay <clears throat> Okay, so I guess we can um, do it where I say my initial thoughts, and then maybe Michael can um, speak on top of that, right? I, I got counterplotted by Michael right now. Surprise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Lannisters. <laughs> okay, so the Lannisters are all about denying your opponent of doing what they want, right? So they're the big party poopers. I, I hope I can say that. Um, <laughs> yes, you can. Oh, whoa, Fabio, <laughs> calm, calm down here. <laughs> PG-13, please. <laughs> um, and anyways, they basically, they try to create not only on the battlefield, but also um, through the tactics cards and the, the tactics board, um, no zones for your opponent. So if your opponent wants to use a non-combat unit, which is a political figure on the tactics board, they'll think twice before they do it because they know not necessarily something will happen, but something bad might happen. And that kind of functions the same through the units. So I'd say that uh, a notable unit is the Lannister Guardsmen, where if you attack them after they are attacked, and they're pretty hefty in armor, right, um, you will do a panic test for each of their remaining ranks. They can use that as an order. And basically, that disencourages your opponent of attacking you because they're thinking, well, I'm going to attack this tanky unit. Um, after that, I'll be punished for that. So they're creating this bubble of protection on the battlefield unless your opponent has ways of going around that. 
and a notable commander, I would say maybe Jamie Lannister or even Tywin Lannister, which are from the starter box and the hero box one, respectively. And well, Jamie is all about him. So that changes a little bit of the focus where he's on the battlefield and he's drawing a lot of attention to his unit and everyone that's around him. But that works as a way as well to, once again, control the battlefield where your opponent has to deal with Jamie. Where Tywin, in the other, uh, in the other hand, tries to keep control of the opponent through condition tokens and make your opponent subpar during the battle. So yes, as Fabio said, you know, when it comes to the Lannister playstyle, they're all about control manipulation on the battlefield. So this is a faction that's going to appeal to those players that like control elements of games or really just want to punish your opponent for doing things. Uh, and creating that kind of experience for them. Like everything they do is going to end up being some double-edged sword, you know, or some element that you have control over. And as far as commanders go, um, just because, like, again, I liked Fabio's picks there, but, you know, the ones you want to start with, I'm going to introduce my personal category of which grizzled old man in the faction should you play? Uh, because this is a Song of Ice and Fire. We have a wealth to choose from. So for this category, we're going to go Tywin Lannister, who is actually one of my favorite characters in the setting. But he kind of represents that Lannister oppression to AT. He is going to weaken your opponent's forces, which is a game mechanic, so they're not as combat effective. He is going to punish your opponent's units by taking away their special abilities and basically just be a nightmare in that control element across the battlefield of debuffing your opponent's guys. And, and Duncan, I know you're a, a Lannister player. Do you have a favorite character or unit, maybe based on sculpt or even on rules, that, that really stands out to you? Um, my favorite unit in the army is the Knights of Castle Rock. And uh, folks who know me will tell you I'm a bit obsessed with knights. <laughs> it's true, because they're awesome. <laughs> 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 And uh, there's there's nothing quite like unleashing a heavy cavalry charge and winning a game with it. So, you know, it's like, <laughs> the, so the Lannisters are, are quite special to me because this faction is uh, was what I started playing with. I started playing the game, but it's what signified for me that this game is very clever and that there's different ways that you can win it beyond just strategy on the battlefield um, because whilst I was doing battlefield tactics of like making sure that my halberdiers were flanked by the guardsmen so that they couldn't you know they, if you attacked them you had to go in through the halberds and all these kind of, you know all these sorts of things I realized that I was better on the tactics board than my opponent was which meant that I had all these devious plays and my cards were more um evil he might say <laughs> and sure, I realized, the end. yeah so they were very special <laughs> for me because i realized at that point that there, there's actually a there's a depth of strategy in this game more so than other games i've played before which really drew me into it but when i started playing and i expanded my army yeah the knights castle rock is what stood out to me because i really enjoyed how the cavalry have the free maneuver action so cavalry feel like cavalry you've got lots of maneuver potential but being Lance Cavalry as well, they were the shock kind where you had to use them appropriately, else they get bogged down and become useless. So I enjoyed the fact it also had that maneuver strategy, which sometimes you don't get in war games when it comes to using cavalry. So yeah, that, those things really stood out. Um, as for character, um, I think I like using Jamie Lannister the most, and I've stubbornly been using Jamie pretty much since I started playing the game. Um, yeah, because, oh gee, you stuck with yeah. him from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, pretty much from the start. Um, and through all different iterations of him, I found him to be absolutely fine. I, I actually used him at a tournament where um, everyone at the tournament considered him to be not very good. And they therefore had never played against him, so they didn't know what he was capable of. So I was able to use this to be devious and started doing really well with him. So <laughs> That's the it's best. Yeah. yeah, I can relate to that. I played a little bit of a, you know, there's a character in Free Folk Tournament. I played a few tournament games. Uh, and I know it's <laughs> just pick someone you like and you're like, I'm going to play this person and you learn you're going to get good and get skillful mm -hmm. with what you got. You do. Yeah, there's there's far more to it than just what looks good on paper. The way you use it and the way you think about it and the tricks you play that really factors into it. Let's say someone heard this and they're like, OK, Lannister, that sounds good. I'm going to start up with that. I, I picked up the Starks versus Lannister starter set. Now they got all these these cool miniatures to paint up. Um, any tips for like getting into painting House Lannister? I, I noticed that on the Duncan Rhodes Painting Academy for your tutorials for the Lannisters, you you prime them in gray first and then build up. Do you ever recommend using like colored primer or are there any other general tips people should keep in mind for painting when they're painting like red or Lannister forces? So. Sometimes. I suppose it kind of depends on what your budget is, uh, because whilst you certainly could spray 
a number of the Lannister troops red. There's actually quite a lot of Lannisters that aren't red. So mm -hmm. um, it becomes a real pain, especially if you're doing the mountains, Benny, you're trying to do yellow over the top of it. Oh. Yeah, red's a very <laughs> strong colour. Yeah, <laughs> you, you've suffered this, right? It, yeah. Red's a very strong colour, and yellow is not. So you've got to kind of think about these things when you're picking what primes you go for. And so um, for me, I tend to stick towards kind of neutral, mid-tone kind of colours. So I'd recommend a medium grey, which is what I used for just about all my Lannisters. Um, because you can paint anything over this and it's just one color that you have to buy then so it keeps your costs down um, but you could certainly pick particular colors for it like so for example if you're doing the warrior sons you could get hold of a silver primer to prime all their armor straight away um, but i'd recommend going for a gray and then just simply base coating whatever relevant colors you want to do on those troops because it whilst it might seem at first glance it's going to take you longer in the long run it's faster so yeah would you ever take advantage of the plastic color oh and do you know i never have um but i've seen people doing that with um with baratheons with the yellow on their shields any excuse to just not deal with yellow yeah, pretty much <laughs> pretty much um one thing does come to mind with lannisters is that the feel of their faction is of course that they're the wealthiest ones around so try and make everything look as pretty and as nice as you can as clean as possible so really clean silvers lots of gold lots of opulence um if you're feeling brave try doing a few things like um like key lines around the edges of like their tunics for example what i mean by that is get a kind of sort of a goldish kind of color something like a um, uh, kind of khaki -ish, like a bone sort of color and do lines going around the outer trim because it makes them look really opulent of course it does require a bit of dexterity so it's just a thing you can add if you want to i think but yeah anything that makes them look fabulous go for it i think you know, the, the line work or the, the the extra detail there that you're mentioning that that, that really sells it and i because i had actually when you you launched your painting academy and you've got your a song of ice and fire stuff in there i had actually already painted my lannister guardsman mm. but then watching you do it you know the extra details and and some of the things at the very end when you're going through uh with like you know skeleton bone or you shot you what is it you shot you shot yeah, Ushanti Ushanti bone, bone. Uh, and just like yeah. adding like a little bit of like highlighting or, or you know edge work on things and suddenly being like oh that actually makes it pop way more i actually was inspired to go back and just like kind of touch my stuff up a little bit um, <laughs> oh, that's awesome that's actually what i've been doing in my land so just recently i've been going back and just adding a few little details to them and adding a bit of varnish some details and things like that yeah they're lovely models i really really like them I, I, the guardsmen have particularly grown on me a lot as well um, oh, and another thought about it. Um, in some of the artwork, a lot of the Lannisters have this kind of metallic red armor. Now, if you want to have that in your troops, it's something I'd recommend you putting on more elite stuff so it makes them pop out a bit more. But if you wanted to do that, then it's worth taking a look at some of the Citadel contrast paints, in particular one called Flesh Terrors Red. And if you paint that over the top of gold, you get a really wonderful metallic red tone that looks perfect. It looks just like the, the artwork on the cards. So I did that quite extensively on my, on my Knights of Cassidy Rock, but I also did it on the Crossbowman, because in the artwork, they have that kind of red metallic effect there. Um, so that's definitely something worth checking out. What if you're not like really a scheming politics, you know, behind the scenes sort of player, and you, you want to kind of get more up there and be a little bit more aggressive? Um, what might be a faction that we'd want to look at next? Well, I'd say you, you get the bang for your buck with Starks, because then you have the opposing house in the same box. And it's a great way to start. What would be the general Stark playstyle then? I guess it's that kind of aggressiveness. Any other things we'd want to highlight there? So the Starks in general, they are a pretty aggressive faction focused on the battlefield and on maneuvers. So although they do, as every other faction, have non-combat units that affect the tactics board, you'll notice that even then their non-combat units are focused on the battlefield. They, they really want to have that battlefield presence uh, as opposed to the Lannisters in, in some regards, we could say. And the Starks as well, their, their main theme, I, I'd say, is that the, the more they get down, the, the, higher, the harder they fight, right? So Starks, as they lose ranks in their units, they will be able to fight harder and gain new benefits from being undermanned. To sum up, I'd say a notable commander would be Ned Stark or even Rob Stark, um, both of them being able to bolster their units. Ned Stark is more of a protective commander where he helps with um, healing and morale, whereas Rob Stark really focuses on getting additional mobility. I really like how you had Eddard Stark when you envisioned him, especially in the 2021 update, as sort of like leading by example and having such a big battlefield presence. 
Uh, literally, you have a, a tactics card that comes with them called Lead by Example, where he like inspires other troops, like improves the morale and improves their like combat effectives, like spurring them on to like fight better. It's just like the subtle ways in which you kind of capture those elements, like the thematic elements, or that if you like were a fan of the books, you're going to be like, oh, sweet, like I see it here. Or maybe not. If you haven't read the books, you can play the characters. And if you ever do get around to the books, like you, you get you can get a sense of the character as you're going through. Yeah, definitely. I guess if you're close to Ned Stark, you want to be honorable, right? You want to mirror his example. So even if he also does lead by example, it also shows how the units um, actually react to him where they, they try to be their best. You recently revealed the, the cards for the She Bears. That unit looks absolutely fantastic. And I love how the Stark faction has all these smaller sub factions within it. And it's not like, you know, they're not a, you know, completely different armies, but they're like, you know, the Starks are a collection of bannermen from northern groups. And you've got your Tullys uh, that, that Duncan was talking about recently, his friend playing. You've got your House Umber Berserkers. You've got the She Bears, you know, from the Mormonts. Uh, and then you get your, you know, your generic Stark swordsmen, your bowmen, those sorts of things. But I love how it kind of pulls together this like unified coalition of troops with all their banners going, but still like looking very distinct on the battlefield. I think that's something that's always impressed me is how you can have so many different units, but they all have a very distinct flavor, even in the Lannisters, but especially in House Stark. Yeah, Chase, so for me, uh, me, I actually am uh, mirroring something Duncan said earlier that some of my favorite visual aesthetics in the Starks are the House Tully armor design, where it all looks like fish scale. That's one of my, I remember when we first had that revealed by our artists way back when we were designing the initial faction. That was one of my favorite and just most impressive pieces I saw. And also ties into the fact that my old grizzled man vote for that faction does go to Brendan Tully himself, uh, because I just really like his play style. If he's going to bunker in and once you're in combat, his guys are just going to get all the more just uh, deadly once they get really engaged in the fight. And actually, Duncan, if I could throw a question at you here, a uh, personal question. So it's so weird of this game. I've painted up so many A Song of Ice and Fire minis, and the House Tully units I've always just thought were so beautiful. Like that's just. The style is so cool. It's this metal, but it's kind of got like a little bit of a bluish tint to the armor. I actually, that's a unit that I never painted. My house Tully Swanseal are like the unpainted Stark unit I have because I've always just been a little intimidated. Like, and I don't know why, but I've had this mental gap where I just think they look so cool in the card art that I haven't like been able to actually put paint on them. Um, mm. Because I get intimidated by getting that like the, the, the metallic, but it's bluish. Would you yes. happen to have any like advice for maybe achieving that effect? Not to like throw you on the spot here, but um... oh no, that's no problem. Um, yes, I do have an answer to that because I've painted my own unit of sworn shields um, because that was actually before I realised my buddy had an, an army of them. Um, I was thinking off the Stark faction. I think the Tullys look the best, and it's it's specifically because of that fish aquatic theme that you guys mentioned with the the, the scale armor. But everything still is kind of like functional, realistic looking gear but with that sort of flair to it, bringing the house imagery into it. So that really appealed to me. Um, I also just happen to like blue and red together. I think that looks really nice. But yes, absolutely. They're, they're actually they're not difficult to paint at all. Um, what you need to do is just um, so I for my own ones, I undercoated with the gray undercoat again. Nice starting point. So I, I essentially undercoat everything in the Stark and to set with the same color. Um, you just roughly paint all that silver first of all. Um, and for this, go for a medium or a dark silver. Uh, plenty of options out there. Go for whichever one appeals to you. But just like hit the whole model with that and making sure you catch the armor, not caring about anything else if you happen to get it at that point. And then you just start blocking out all the features beyond there. And that includes things like their tunics, um, which I went for a deep red color. I believe it was can um, corn red I picked for that. Um, for the shield, it, well, the heraldry, you want a dark blue. Uh, for the leather, go for a deep brown, that sort of thing. So you just kind of work your way through picking all those things out. Wash the model entirely with a black wash. And the black wash gives a kind of cleaner finish to things. So it makes the equipment look really nicely maintained which I felt kind of fit their feel. Um, and then for that, the bluish tint, I only did it on the scale arm, which appeals around the mm -hmm. body of the Sworn Shields. And for this, you want to kind of bluish green wash. Um, now, from Citadel's range, Coelia Green Shade is the one that I used, but there's loads of different ones out there. Any sort of bluish green color, you simply wash that over that part of the miniature, let it dry, then you just move on to, um, on the plates, do what we call layering, which is to apply a thin coat of the original color um, over that area, but kind of avoiding the dark bits like your shades revealed. And um, this then brightens those parts up and you suddenly get a really nice contrast between that sort of aquamarine kind of bluish scale and then the bright polished silver armor. And then from that point on, it just all comes together. 
It's something that we'll certainly want to do a video upon. I have a, a box them specifically for that reason, so we will do a video on them one day. Um, Fantastic, then. Yeah, but that's not painted mine. Okay. Oh man, I'm excited. This will be my project, then. I will get these finally done, so I can have them looking nice on the table. And because it's a lot of metallic, it's it seems like it would be somewhat simple, but I just. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, not, um, they're not difficult models to paint. They, they look complex because of the amount of, like, shapes, I guess, on them and the silhouette. But really, they're not that difficult. Most of them is silver, and it's only part of them that has that bluish green on them. So um, hit them with that silver first of all, and everything gets easier from that point on. Um, sorry, could I ask you a question as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, could you use sort of like a mirrored technique from what from the example you gave of the Lannisters, where you base them with silver and then you apply a blue contrast paint, or would that not work? You could do. The danger would be to make it look too blue, because if you're going for that kind of polished steel, what you have to do is really reduce the strength of the paint, because you don't just want to turn it into like a blue armor. Right. Um, so what I'd do is take one of the, the washers. I'd actually go for one that's a much more bright blue, so it probably would have been, it probably would be one of the contrast paints, though the name escapes me when I put on the spot. I think um, it's not ethematic blue. To techless blue, I'll find out. <laughs> um, but what you do is you get um, a blue, bright blue wash, and you dilute it heavily with a medium. Um, and there's a whole again a load of these different brands out there. The one I'd probably go for is Lamia Medium myself. But you really thin it down so it's really, really thin, really weak, and then you just kind of wash that over the armor plating. And what it does is it gives a subtle hint of blue. And so you just want that just gentle appearance of it. If you do it too heavy, then yeah, you get blue armor and that's not their field. So it's like a, a subtle thing. And then you move on to highlighting from there and you should get that little element of it still there. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh yeah, take all these notes down here. <laughs> like, oh wait, we're recording this. I'll just go back and listen to it. All right. Uh, and and that's, you know, two of these big factions. And you know, one of the cool things about the game in general is that these have these large trays, right? And, um, you know, it actually gives you a lot of room for modeling. I know we've been talking a lot about kind of painting details here, but any, any ideas for how to maximize and, and make use of these trays to do kind of cool scenic basing? Uh, any, any tips or, or things that you found have been really effective or, or stand out as really looking beautiful? I guess I can say on this that I have the thing that I would suggest is to not go overboard. Uh, and I say that with an asterisk. But like I have seen a lot of times where, you know, you'll do bases and I've been guilty of this before where you just want to keep adding more and more stuff to it. But eventually it looks like, you know, you have a bunch of soldiers that are now just marching over a giant trash heap. And it's like there's no way that they would actually be going over this terrain. So That's when it comes true. to like, the bases and the trays, I love like base work and uniform, uh, uniform trays and everything. But I do think that uh, kind of holding back is the better way to go there, you know, just. Basically, if you have a couple elements on the base and the, uh, on the tray, that's great. And then just leave those to because that makes them all the more special rather than just overloading it. Now, the asterisk I was talking about earlier is I've seen some people do the exact opposite approach where they just load as much stuff as they can on the movement tray. So I remember this one that immediately came to mind was I forget. I think it was a unit of champions of the stag, but it might have been just another heavy cavalry where they were just completely decked out in an amazing paint job. And then the the tray and the bases just had this like epic, like forest scenery, just like little mini diorama on there that just was completely big and over the top as if someone had made like a actual painting competition diorama. But every single tray was like that. That was so just over the top and cohesive that that actually worked. So I feel that if you're going to take that aesthetic approach, you have to overload it. But otherwise, you run the risk of just, you know, uh, going slightly too much. And I'm always a fan in that case of less is better, because I feel that, you know, you want your models to stand out. You want the little base elements that you've chosen to stand out. And if you put too many on there, then it begins to take away from the uniqueness of everything. I'd also say that a little goes a long way. And I've seen people do on Knights of Casterly Rock, where they just add a fence in the middle. And that makes the tray kind of look like a jousting arena. And just oh. that already added enough flavor where you look at the model and, and the whole tray and you see a story there, right? And I guess that's the big advantage of the, of the big trays, of the movement trays, where you can actually just tell a little story just by adding a few props. Well, let's, let's get through some of the other factions and talk about just their general play style and, and maybe pry some more painting tips from Duncan here. Um, so, you know, we also have neutrals. And uh, if you want to get started with neutrals, the neutrals actually don't have a starter set. Uh, the neutrals can be fielded in any faction except, sadly, the Free Folk, because no coin beyond the wall. Um, but you can pick up the first hero box or, or the hero boxes and get your, your tactics deck in there to, to 
to start playing. Um, so, Michael, what's the general idea behind the neutral faction as a play style if you're just going to play them as your main faction? That's a bit of a diverse question there because the, the factoring around the neutrals is that they're probably more than any other faction directly uh, influenced by the commander that you choose. So most every faction's commander is going to change the play style in some subtle way, but your overall faction aesthetic is going to stay the same. So Glannisters are always going to be counterplotting and, you know, scheming. Starks are always going to be aggressive. Both the neutrals, it really changes up based on your commander. So if you have Ramsey Bolton or, um, you know, Roos Bolton running your army, that's going to play different than one run by like Fargo Holt or some other options that you might have come up. So your commander choice is really going to dictate your play style when it comes to neutrals. You have a favorite neutral commander there. I'm a big fan of Ramsey Snow because his play style is all about just creating some truly bad choices for your opponent, not in the way that Lannisters do, where it's like, oh, if you do this, you might get punished. He has cards like, you know, uh, sadistic games where he actively is going to make your opponent choose between some but some bad choices. And your opponent just like has to like, okay, which one's the least bad for me at the time? And of course, being the savvy player that you are, you've already anticipated they're going to choose this and just doubly capitalize on it, you know, uh, when they they foolishly thought they were doing good for themselves. I feel like they've got some really cool units here. Duncan, I don't know if you have a favorite neutral unit, but there's a few that definitely stand out for me. Um, well, I really like the flayed men. Um I think as far as I'm seeing a theme they, here. <laughs> yeah, well, I know, I know it's a little bit, but bear with me, bear with me. There's more on this. Uh, the um, So the flayed men are just really beautiful sculpts. Um, they look really scary, really creepy, but they're very dynamic. Um, the way they're holding their flails, the way they're kind of like, um, there, there's subtle things you can do in miniatures of things that give the suggestion of movement. And they have that because the way the flails kind of swinging behind them suggests they're moving at speed and they're heavy as well. And they're like not going to stop when they hit you. So there's a lot of narrative built into them that way as well. I've also seen them painted in an absolutely beautiful way where um, the armor's done as a really dark metal, um, which it suggests in the card as well, actually on the back of them, you know, that all the, the Bolton armors are blackened. And I, I saw this done and it looks wonderful. And it's actually a very simple way to do it too. Um, but for the the colour for them, using a kind of a burgundy, like a sort of a, a deep reddish kind of pink rather than pink as it's often portrayed, um, this makes them look really dangerous, like really kind of intimidating. It's a really nice colour combination. So yeah, if anyone was interested in doing that, to achieve that dark metal, all you do is you, you paint in your normal way of blocking those silver details and stuff with your chosen metal. Um, you basically all your details, you wash them, the miniature. But when it comes to that armour, if you go over it with another one of those contrast paints, and this one's Black Templar, and this is a very strong strong contrast paint so it'll look very dark when you first put it on but some of that metallic shows through so as the miniature catches the light you realize it's actually a super dark silver and it looks lovely and um, it's very easy to achieve that result as well so i'd definitely recommend that but for me i think the unit that i'm most excited about isn't out yet and that is the uh the hedge knights oh, i knew uh, it yeah, i knew yeah, it yeah. i knew it before <laughs> he even said it i knew he was going to say it Oh yeah, <laughs> these are these are my thing. Um, uh, <laughs> I I am a sucker for any kind of knight that has heraldic designs and a caparison on a horse where I can put designs and patterns and things on that. So oh man, I am going to be getting so many of those. So we've got oh, an army of hedge knights, but Duncan the hedge knight, you know Duncan the tall. You you got to paint one up and and then do you uh, you know as someone who's a fan of of cavalry in general and 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 painting miniatures have you ever like designed your own coat of arms like what we see like a a Duncan the tall or maybe just a Duncan the Rhodes one with like a your own <laughs> symbol on the shield like <laughs> um no i did um so uh, in years past i did make up a, a character who was a knight um who appeared on a Wikipedia of that same game as well as if he was part of the law. And that amused me because his name is basically my name. And I don't think anyone realized. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's official law or not. I, don't, I really don't know, but I thought that was funny. That's about as close as it's ever gone to being made into something official, I guess. But would it be coats? Um, would it be brushes? Would it be... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's well for my own heraldry. I don't know what it would be these days. I've not really thought about it. Um, but I've I've painted a lot of um, fancy medieval knights, like a whole host of them, and I've really gone into learning about the heraldic schemes and how you do these sorts of patterns, and then how you can freehand them and use water slide decals to in you know in, enhance the patterns and things. So I think with these hedge knights, there's a lot of room to really play around with that and i cannot wait to get some of those and start doing that yeah, yeah. if you guys make a character who's a neutral that's going to be on a horse then i'm going to have armies <laughs> of hedge and there we go call marketing we're just going to sell to one one guy we know our yeah. marketing 
Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sold 200 <laughs> boxes to one guy. <laughs> like, so I don't know what's going on here, but we're selling out in this one location. Wow, the UK really likes this box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, we have a few more factors here. Night's Watch, the dastardly Night's Watch. General general overview, if you want to explain their play style as opposed to the other factions in the game, what makes the, the Night's Watch so unique? So what the Night's Watch lack in numbers, they have in quality. Um, basically, these men were forced to stand there and fight and protect the wall forever and so the basic play style around this is that you're going to have a small cohesive force of elite units and as the game progresses they will get stronger and stronger by taking in um, vows through the tactics cards um, although the vows are not really properly a game term you'll notice that the name of the cards are all names of the vows that they swear when they become night's watch members and that's basically the gist of it right you you want to consolidate your objectives early and, and try to stay there throughout the game and and grind your opponent through by the fact that you're albeit outmanned uh, completely outgunning them through quality of units and you know speaking of uh, grizzled men here this is like a faction of grizzled men michael any notable character or unit that would stand out to you you know i almost made the mistake of saying this faction was like a grizzled old man buffet but i realized that you know things that we say on the internet are forever and that might not be a phrase we want hovering out we're uh, we're gonna cut that one out right right chase right, right. yes of course okay. <laughs> Um, but for this case, I would have to say, uh, and I know I've said this a couple times, uh, going to one of my favorite characters in the setting, but we have to go with Jorah Mormont here just because, you know, you have the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. And this is the guy who is keeping an entire group of, you know, uh, thieves and murderers and all of them just together as a cohesive force. And one of the only, like, actual, like... I don't want to say the Night's Watch aren't honorable, but there's definitely there for mixed reasons. But he's the one of the ones that actually fully believes in the cause, you know, him and like Horn Halfhand. But I just really like Jorah. He's one of my favorite sculpts in the game as well, just because he's got his pet um, crow, you know, with him on the sculpt. And I just think that's really cool and just badass. And he just really conveys that whole stoicism pose, but also this air of just like just threatening dominance around him. And this is a, a faction of just really hardy individuals, right? Who, you know, can weather the storm and their vows. You can really take a lot of damage and give a lot of damage out depending on the unit one of the big things though is the entire faction you know is based on a, a color scheme that can be somewhat maybe well maybe it's actually really easy to paint but maybe and it's it's actually kind of difficult to paint this much black duncan when you're painting an army that is by nature like mostly clad in black robes uh, or black clothing what do you do to make it so that the, the faction doesn't look like just like an inky black hole when you put it on the on the table well there's a there's a few things you can do um the first and the biggest thing I would suggest is to well, the, there's not actually just one shade of black you can do. There's loads and loads of different shades of black. And so on miniatures like this, where they tend not to have lots of armor and like, visible, really, it's all kind of like layers of fabrics and leathers and things like that. What you should try and do is to get a selection of different tones of black that you can do and paint the different layers in those different tones, because this helps separate the different layers. And overall, as a piece, they'll look like they're wearing black. But actually, what you've got is things like a really dark brown and kind of a bluish black and a grayish black. And the these sorts of different tones across the miniature um now we uh, we did actually a video it's on youtube where there's i believe there's four different tones of black that i use on one miniature and yeah what i'd recommend you do is just look at doing something like that and just from model to model just change which bits you're painting with those different shades and you'll get an army that looks like each piece of equipment's bespoke for that particular brother but it'll look overall like they're all wearing these dark colors and they'll fit the theme as well so um the next thing i would say is don't be afraid of using some brown on there particularly dark browns but this is a great way of breaking up the color a little bit um if you have one in four guys wearing a dark brown coat they'll still look the part but it won't look as just a side wall of black um next thing i would look for opportunities to put in little flashes of a warmer color in there and um, what i tend to go for is like a, a warm leather brown and i'll use this on things like the grips of swords and scabbards and stuff like that so just kind of put a spot in there and you can also get a light color in the fur that goes on them and i'd use kind of grays kind of khakis things like that um 
The last thing is actually on their basing. Um, the most common basing thing I see on Night's Watch is to go for snow, which looks fantastic. But something to bear in mind is that if you want a lot of snow, the, the white and the black are such an extreme contrast that it can look a little bit strange. Um, especially if you like taking photographs of them, your camera can struggle to handle the sheer difference in these two tones. Um, so it's something to think about. If you want to have some snow on there, I would recommend having little patches of it. Um, but really, it's a matter of personal taste. If you like to have loads of snow on there, then don't let me stop you. Oh, that's a really good point about, especially the, I did a lot of snow on my bases and that was a problem I had. I'm like, oh, it's really hard to... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a it, it it's not a well known thing, but yeah, it's definitely if you do have those extremes, then yeah, a camera can really struggle to to work out what's going on. <laughs> and then Michael, uh, you know, if you're just getting into this game and you're listening along, trying to hear a little bit of the factions, and and you're like, wow, these are these all sound great. Can you tell us a little about Michael why the free folk, this next faction, is is the best faction uh, in the game? Well, they definitely have the biggest diversity, I think, of visual aesthetics because they all represent different uh, tribes of free folk. And just because they are different than the basic armies of Westeros, that is also why they carry a different aesthetic because these guys are almost from an entirely different uh, quote unquote world than the Seven Kingdoms. So, you know, you have a just everything is so unique from the Thin Warriors to the Followers of Bone to the Spearwives. Uh, you know, they all just carry such a different look to them. So if you want like a diversity in like a painting project or something like that, then that is definitely something to go with. And this wraps up the play style as well, because each of those brings a different, you know, ability to the camp. And you have a bunch of just random cheap units there that are meant to like kind of be greater than the uh, than the, each each of the, the some of their parts is greater than the individual pieces. But in addition to that, you also have some of the most unique stuff in the game, such as giants, mammoths. You know, if you want some things that are very visually distinct, this is the faction for you. There, Chase. Now, a pay, pay up, please. That's amazing. That was the <laughs> nicest thing you've ever said about free folks, and it was so eloquent and perfect. That is exactly true, a hundred percent. Oh my gosh. Um, and you know, cool characters. Obviously, things like Tormund Giants Bane, but also like Mance Raider. But there's a lot of fun. I, I you know, I have a lot of fun going through and just painting these miniatures. And you've got your, you know, your, your, your uh, standard tans and leather as like, you know, your, your cloth materials. Then you got guys decked in like piles of bones or, or even like the Fen Warriors, which, um, you know, they've, they've unlocked sort of bronze equipment. And actually bronze can often be challenging to paint in itself. That was something that kind of like caught me off guard as I was going to the faction. I feel like I've done a lot of like silvers or like, you know, met metallic armors. But when I got to the bronze, you know, that was something that kind of like tripped me up a little bit. Luckily, another plug for the Duncan Rhodes Painting Academy here. You actually did some stuff on hoplites, Greek hoplites or hoplite. I don't know how you want to say it. And, uh, you know, that got me, uh, gave me some clues there. But for people who uh, maybe haven't had a lot of time painting bronze, any like general approach for for painting that? Things to keep in mind? Um, I think um, bronze ain't too difficult. Right? It, it's uh, you can drift too far into going to, into gold. So you've got to be careful sort of like the yeah. base coats you go for. And um, <laughs> what Sorry. I recommend is... <laughs> 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 so um, what I would look for is a nice, um, rich kind of base coat to go for. The one I typically use is called Balthazar Gold. It's a really lovely color. It's got lots of, it, it covers really nicely. Um, wash it with a brown as well. And you'll find this tends to dull it down quite a lot. So when you move on to highlighting it, you can do a technique called glazing. And a great color for this is called Psychorax Bronze. Now, this is a very thin color. And at first glance, you might see it and think that there's something up with it because it's just so thin. But if you um, add some water to it on your palette, make sure it's not quite translucent on there and kind of thinly apply it over the top of the bronze, that deep color will show through and it will gain a really nice shine to it. And you can get a really beautiful bronze out of doing that. In addition, um, it's an opportunity to add a little flash of color into the army because you can use verdigris, which um, for those not aware, is basically rust on bronze. So little flashes are kind of like a very bright aquamarine sort of blue. All you gotta do is get like a very bright bluish kind of color like that, thin it down lots and just dot it into little corners and things where water might collect. And it just gives a, a really nice weathered appearance to it. And as I mentioned, a nice flash of color, which on an army like this, where you tend to have lots of browns and things, it just really adds to it very nicely. I think I go back and re redo mine now. <laughs> I'll touch them up. I'll well, they are a great army to collect. There's, um, there's, so when, you, when you're kind of displaying an out an army, is it like a visual thing of what appeals to people? I think that works very nicely It's having things in there that break up the silhouette of the overall force. So if you have, say, for example, an infantry army where everything's kind of the same size from a distance, it looks very kind of very samey as a big wall, right? 
Um, if you have things in there to mix it up, like cavalry, that's great. But if you're able to have a mammoth and giants and things like that, this makes a really dynamic, really interesting looking force. So when deployed for battle, they just look absolutely fantastic. Um, and if I didn't know loads of people who wanted to collect these guys, I probably would have started painting my own by now, but I'm not allowed to because... <laughs> that's the only <laughs> thing I hold against you is how do you how do you not have a free folk army yet, Duncan? Come on. <laughs> oh. I've got one planned. Okay. Yeah, All right. Then. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> and let, let's jump in. We've got just a few more houses here uh house baratheon now fabio i know that house baratheon is one that's near and dear to your heart how what's keeps you know house baratheon maybe what makes it stand apart from say factions like the lannisters or maybe even the night's watch which might have like well armored troops or have hardy individuals um what's the overall faction design for the baratheons so baratheons are really a grinding faction right they want to be stuck in the thick of things they want to be engaged into combat and they really want the game to extend itself to later rounds because they will usually decay slower than their opponent. So the longer the battle runs, the more advantages the Baratheons will have. And also there's a second layer to the Baratheons faction identity, which is the list building, where you have two different loyalties in the Stannis and the Renly camp, as people call them, where if you use Stannis-aligned units, such as real or faithful units, where they believe in the Lord of Light, you won't then be able to field in the same army Renly aligned units, which would be, for example, the support of High Garden. Absolutely. So then it's you know so basically you get to you have to choose a camp, right? There's a little bit of infighting uh, in this faction. In a way, but since in tournaments we use a two list format, where and Baratheons are still one faction, you could technically take a Stannis list and a Renly list, and that would be fine. And it's actually a pretty smart idea because they play pretty differently and then you you have a lot of holes covered uh, and uh any favorite unit and oh, actually duncan you know have you taken that you've you've painted some baratheons up i know because you've got tutorials here any uh, baratheon units that kind of catch your eye that you like the design of i mean i know you're someone who likes knights and they've got you know foot knights they've got mounted knights any unit that you really visually like uh well i suppose people are going to expect me to say the champions of the stag right uh, yep. <laughs> which are great models. Actually, are, we, are we three for three? Oh, oh no, oh no, okay, wait. I would say, actually, I th I think, um, so in the Baratheons, there's a few things. I think the regular Wardens look really nice. They've got a really kind of imposing appearance, that kind of great helm they all wear, with the little eye holes on them. They look really, really cool. I also very much like the Rose Knights. Um, it's because oh, I, God, I like yeah. green as a color. Green's one of my favorite colors, and I think the Rose Knights look really cool. And again, they've got a very sort of slightly eerie appearance to their great helms and the mask, the way they're shaped. They're really, really nice to models, those ones. They're very, very cool. Um, so, yeah, those ones are ones that stand out to me. I also think the Royal or Faithful are great because um, of the fun of having flaming swords. So it's... There's quite a few, really. I, I can't say I'm drawn to one immediately. Um, the biggest issue I have when it comes to Baratheons is deciding which loyalty to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you say you love green as your as one of your favorite colors, and, and that's good because you know yellow, the the other colors you might be painting that aren't rose knights, that could be a pretty challenging color to paint. Yes. Um, so you know what do you what do you recommend for doing that? Because that's actually something I've I personally struggled with, and to the point where I'm like you know I went through all sorts of phases where I was like, am I using the wrong paint for yellow, mm -hmm. or am I just doing it? You know, am I not doing enough thin coats perhaps? <laughs> um, but you know what makes it so difficult? What and what what do you do? How, how what do you recommend? Mm, the dreaded yellow it's um yeah yellow has always been a difficult one because it's such a thin color it's such a weak color so getting it to cover evenly is difficult and once you achieve that if you make a mistake on it then mm. fixing that mistake is very difficult now luckily when it comes to baratheons you don't actually have to do that much yellow on them because so much of them is plate mail so you can mm -hmm. really just get away with only painting their shields yellow and for this what i'd recommend doing is I mean, the usual starting with a gray and building up um, but a great paint for doing yellow that really helps out is called avalan sunset which has got really great cover coverage it's sort of a mustardy yellow so it's not necessarily might, might be what people want for the yellow for their baratheons they might want a more one with more punch but what it does is provides a foundation for you to do a brighter yellow over the top of it, which you'll find then becomes much easier to apply. And if you go in that order, you'll find suddenly actually getting that initial yellow isn't that difficult. It's just you've got to be careful not to make any mistakes on it. Um, but luckily with Baratheons, all you'll do is paint that stag and you're basically sorted. For the other details on them, things like there's kind of, um, you can see part of their armor is leather kind of around the legs. And for this, you don't have to do it yellow. You can do it all kinds of shades of brown, blacks, things like that. Um, you could even do it dark greens, which, um, so. There's various bits of medieval armor, which are kind of um, uh, they're like leather padded, but they've got metal plates sewn into them. 
um, the name of them escapes me, but um, this kind of... And that's what I liked about yours, though. Mm. You, you painted them that brown and leathery color down there uh, on the legs. And, and I realized that if you don't do it that way, if you paint it all yellow, it's it's actually too much yellow in a weird way. Like it, mm. it sometimes detracts from the unit. It does, yeah. You only need to have a subtle little bit of the yellow up there. The only important bit showing the heraldry, that's where it matters. But yeah, you could even do this um, this part. I wish I could remember the name of this armor. It, you could do it in dark green because I've seen lots of in reenactment circles. I've seen this armor frequently being in a dark green color, um, and this then means that if you're playing as Renly, you've got hints of green on your troops. But if you're playing as Stannis, it's not so much or something that's out of place. That is heraldry. So it's a nice way of kind of having them fit both sides in that way. Something I've been dabbling with as a thought is getting hold of a yellow spray paint. So army paints do one called demonic yellow. Um, that's a very bright, punchy yellow. And I'm thinking about making a kind of, getting a piece of paper, just cutting a, like a, a slit in it and a little hole so the guy can um, poke his arm through it and just spraying so just his shield's bright yellow and the rest of him's grey and then just painting on from there. That's a little shortcut I'm just pondering at the moment to make him a bit quicker to do. Oh, that's a good <laughs> so, idea. Yeah, hmm. you could always try doing that. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, following those stages really helps out, I think. And yeah, like I say, you only need to do yellow on the heraldic bits where the stag's going to be. Unless you're going all in for Renly, in which case you could paint it green instead and not worry about it. <laughs> and then for House Targaryen, uh, you know, an iconic faction uh, in that, you know, a lot of people who have watched the show or uh, even, of course, read the books. And there's a lot of like fan favorites and things to like in this faction. What's the idea behind the, the Targaryen faction as a whole, Michael? The Targaryens probably, uh, so we spoke about previously in the neutrals, like how their commanders really make a difference in the gameplay. That is also true with the Targaryens, as there is probably the most eclectic and diverse bunch of characters in that uh, faction versus any other because like the Lannisters are all Lannisters the Starks are all Starks they have different personalities but they all kind of function in the same under the same banner and the same ideology but with Daenerys and her forces under House Targaryen there's just such a big diversity of characters that all function differently for his old old man pick to Daenerys Targaryen herself to Cal Drogo distinct personality that is in no way similar to the other ones and so that's represented by the fact that the Targaryen cards for their commanders, they actually have four tactics cards as opposed to the usual three, just to show that extreme diversification amongst their commanders. So, and I think that amongst them, of just different styles of units, and I mean visual Thraki, like horse uh, horde running your army. You could have an unsullied army of hyper elite units. You can have storm crows who are just a ragtag bunch of Neris and her dragons. So in starting Targaryens, I think the first thing um, people might see is something that, as I say, can be intimidating because of being presented with so many horses and so much flesh to paint. And these are two things that people have often said to me they find intimidating to paint. But I would firstly encourage people not to worry about it so much because um, in that Targaryen initial army, there's not actually that many figures because if you think about it, each unit's only four miniatures. So firstly, it's not that many horses to paint. I mean, the, the start box is... I believe it's 20 miniatures in total, and you've got like a full army, so don't worry too much about it taking too long. Um, but for the horses, just go for a dark brown. It's nice and easy, they'll look the part, wash the manes and tails black, and if you want to take it further, you certainly can do so by adding things like um, diamond patterns onto them, all the socks and the legs and things like that, and you can start to add more detail if you like. But just getting them started, that initial colour, um, it's amazing what a difference it makes to get some colour on the miniature and to get going. If you just sit and look at them undercoated thinking, ah, you know, what do I do? Then that can be a bit of a hurdle. But if you just get going, it gets much easier. When it comes to flesh, um, what I would say is the key part about painting it is when you're getting to this layering stage. So typically, if you're painting miniatures in the way that I do, what you'll do is base coat, then wash something to get some definition on it. Then you layer it where you need things up and then you highlight it. So I tend to paint things in these four stages. When it comes to flesh, you want to retain a sort of translucency there because skin is translucent, right? So you start with quite a deep kind of color. And again, there's loads of different flesh tones out there. Um, wash it with a sort of reddish brown. When it comes to the layering, purposefully go into that expecting to be applying lots of thin coats of paint here right um because what you want to do is put on a thinned down first coat so that it looks a little bit washed out a little bit flat but when you put your next coat on there you can start to make the color stronger on the muscles and things and start to follow the shape of them and then if you take it onto a third you can push that even further if you want to but you'll find if you approach it in those stages in mind you'll get a really nice realistic result on the flesh that isn't actually all that difficult it's really the same stages of painting things like fabric 
Um, it's just it's a slightly different shape. Um, don't be intimidated by it. We do, again, on our YouTube channel, if you're not sure and you're a bit worried about it, we do have a full video where we show painting one of the um, the Thraki so you can see it in action. But yeah, it's, it's not a difficult. The skin is the key thing to tackle. Once you feel confident with it, you'll suddenly find that House Targaryen really opens up to you because all the troops do have quite a bit of skin on there. If you can do a good job on, on that, then all the miniatures going to look great. Do you mind if I add just one more question here? <laughs> Try to squeeze as much as I can. Uh... One thing that I find is that usually if you're uh, painting armored units and they look uniform, that actually improves the look of the whole unit, right? Because they look pristine and well-kept. While horses, if they all look the same, it, it kind of makes the army duller because that's not what you expect when you see many horses, right? They're not supposed to be uniform. Is there a simple way, like a, a kind of like painting hack where I can still prime them all brown or, or base coat them all brown, but make them different enough? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what generally you'll have a quite a similar breed across the army um and these sorts of things so what you start doing is looking for the individual patterns that you can have on those breeds of horses and that's um things like um like diamonds or the colors on their muzzle or the socks on their feet that sort of thing where you can add flashes of a lighter color and amongst the brown if you're going for like a darker brown for example doing that sort of thing helps break thing, things up and there's there's quite an odd thing when it comes to um, armies, like uh, which I'll expand on in a second. But when you want to pick out particular characters, if you do the horses in different colours, then they can stand out more. And in history, you'd see certainly see things like this, like generals would have a, a white horse, for example, or a musician would have a white horse, so everyone can see them clearly. So when it gets to things like you're doing your um, the coes um, and your veterans, you could do all of them with a completely different coloured horse. So as you start to distribute them amongst your army, they really stand out and break things up as characters standing. Out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and that's um, that kind of leads me to think there's actually quite a curious thing when it comes to organized armies versus more kind of barbarian sort of armies. And this is a weird thing, right? If you're doing a organized army and you want to make a unit appear more veteran, if you paint them more disheveled and with slightly different colors on different troops and things, it makes them look more veteran. Whereas on the other hand, if you're painting more of a kind of a horde army and everything's like lots of different colors and you know, they're quite very uh, varied. If you paint one unit really organized, suddenly they look elite. So it's kind of like the opposite on either side. So it's quite odd, but it's just a little uh, painting hack to remember. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> There's their Fen and the Free Folk, right? They're like, they're the organized ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the Fen, you do them all really organized looking. And suddenly it's like, oh, those guys are elite. Uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, when the horses... Um, yeah, it's um, just adding those little elements, those little flashes. So if you look at lots of um, photographs of horse, like you pick, pick the particular breed you want to do for that army. And you could go for like a warmer brown, for example. Um, if you start like a chestnut kind of horse, for example, uh, if you start looking at different patterns they have, you start to see there's lots of variety and you can use those to break things up. But it means you can initially paint them all with that consistent color and then you can go back in and add as much variety as you like to afterwards. Fantastic. And then that brings us to our last faction and the newest kids on the block, uh, House Greyjoy. Uh, now, this is a really exciting faction, not only because the sculpts are amazing, but it's one that a lot of people were, were really excited for, even going back to the Kickstarter. And I always find it's funny when it's like, you know, Targaryens and dragons, like that makes sense. Uh, you know, the Baratheon, Stannis, Loyalists, like, OK, that makes sense. But Greyjoy, it turns out, has this, like, this fanatical following. And then you came out with such amazing sculpts and miniatures for it that it like just, you know, amplified it by 100. What's the general idea? If someone's thinking about sitting down and they're like, OK, I'm, I'm going to get into Song, Voice and Fire. This faction, I see a lot of like, you know, sort of the like Cthulhu Viking-esque people on the cover of this box. Um, what's the play style that they should be aware of? What, what are they going to get if they pick up that starter set? Well, the Greyjoys are raiders, right? And what they want is to pick village and and just wreck havoc right so they introduce an interesting mechanic which is part of their faction identity which is the pillage mechanic where as the Greyjoys um, destroy enemy ranks they gain bonuses and become stronger and that varies d depending on what unit you're using what's really interesting about this as well is that the Greyjoys to represent this Viking s esque this Viking esque theme they're very lightly armored, as usually sailors would be, I suspect. And so they really rely as well on healing. So you, you kind of have this way of keeping your sustain by healing as fast as your opponent is damaging you. But at the same time, you really need to get those initial attacks going. So you really depend on your alpha strikes, if that makes sense, to trigger your, trigger your pillage engine. And then I'd say that uh, a couple of notable commanders here 
would be Victorian Greyjoy, which is the captain of the Iron Fleet, and he's very aggressive, and I think he's very well represented in the sense that he doesn't mind the situation of the battlefield. He will keep pushing and he will keep attacking. And another very interesting commander and attachment in general is Euron Greyjoy. And I believe that in, in this case, he's just such a distinct character, regardless of whatever faction he might have been. <laughs> Let's say if he was born in the North, right, and, and he was Euron Stark, he would still be a very interesting character. So although he sort of differs from the Greyjoy mentality, he is still maintained as a Greyjoy through the high risk, high reward mind game situation where he's affecting your opponent and yourself, where you both have to kind of take note that, oh, Euron is here. The game is now different. Uh, Michael, who's your grizzled uh, Greyjoy character here? Uh, so this is actually a fun fact thing here because I'm going to say Balon Greyjoy, but here's the thing. He's not actually that old. And this is a misconception that uh, and happens is because, so a lot of people like, again, you can't ignore the fact that the show is a reference for a lot of people. And he's just uh, portrayed as just this old guy in the show, like, you know, basically just an old man. But in the books, he's like in his, uh, I believe it's early 50s or so. And the thing about A Song of Ice and Fire is that there's very few individuals who are in that middle section. Like you have Maester Aemon from the Night's Watch, who is, uh, you know, pushing near 100. And then you have Eddard Stark in his grizzled old age of, you know, defending the North and being King of Winterfell, who is 34. <laughs> mm. You know, Sean Bean played a really convincing role there. So like all the, all the, the people in the books like are de-aged like Rob died when he was 16 in the books and you know he took place two years before that Jon Snow was 13 when he is sent to the wall um so yeah you're a uh, Balon there is actually getting my vote for a grizzled old guy of the faction just because I I do like his ruthless approach of things where like listen all my troops are a complete resource I don't care about what happens to any individual out there as long as we win this overall fight and the great joy bring with them not only a fun play style and an amazing scope but they give you a lot of like basing opportunities and Duncan you came out with a, a really fantastic um, water style base that could be used for great joy or any other tips in addition to that that might be uh, helpful for getting great joys looking nice and on the table um, I think um, the initial thing I would say is that the the box set and the cards and things all have this very kind of like um, stormy blue kind of scheme. Now, their house color is actually black with a gold kraken, but this stormy blue is so synonymous with the feel of them that I would definitely recommend making that consistent theme across the force. So, I mean, for my own ones, I've been using it on all the cloaks um, to kind of have that consistent matching thing. Um, in addition, what I would look to do is to add subtle bits of weathering to them, because if they're going to be on out at sea a lot um, with all their metal equipment, no matter how well you look after it, there's going to be a bit of corrosion going on there. So maybe not for the characters, might keep their equipment really nice and shiny just to make them stand out more. When it comes to your regular troops, think about adding little touches, very slight subtle touches of things like rust to the blade of their axes and a little bit on their chain mail, perhaps a tiny bit of verdigris if you've got any brass on there. There's very small, subtle things. And this is very easy to do if you get like a kind of a... Um, a warm brown color thin it down with lots of water so it's very 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 thin and just once you are on the final stages of your miniature just like just a thinly apply just a little bit to this and just let it sort of flow onto the miniature and settle as it will you'll get a really nice effect and it's a subtle thing but it adds a lot to the narrative and the character of the army so that's something i definitely recommend people do and those are the, the, the nine factions that we have available. And so hopefully if you haven't played A Song of Ice and Fire and you listened through all of that, you got a quick idea of what the factions might play like. But if you're a veteran player and you know all about the factions already and you're really into this, hopefully you got a little bit of insight from Duncan about ways you could maybe use tricks or tips to improve your painting and your miniatures or maybe be inspired to do some other things so we try to try, kind of tried to weave the line and have a little bit of something for everybody as we went through this duncan you're painting through these factions what are you what are you working on right now so you have lannister's good and you did your starks what, what have you got on the table? Mm. What have you what have you gone through and what have you got on the table now? Oof. Well, yeah, I painted my Lannisters and my Starks. Um, I painted a Targaryen army, and I'm currently thinking about doing an Unsullied um, sort of sub-faction with that. I've also finished a Night's Watch army. I'm currently painting Greyjoys. Um, so I'm kind of just, you know, working my way through all the factions. My gosh. <laughs> Um, it's quite addictive, is this game? Uh, <laughs> um, I keep thinking of doing a House Bolton army, and Ooh, yeah, be there's cool. um, I'm going to end up painting them all. But yeah, I've got lots of ideas, and this tournament I'm going to 
is kind of making me think of picking a faction and doing two distinct sub factions. So I'm thinking Lannister, starting to look at maybe doing either a faith militant force to go along with it or a house Clegane force. So we'll see. It'll either be that or it'll be Targaryens with Dothraki and Unsullied, but we'll see. But those, those are the kind of things I'm looking at. Um, I suppose as like a, a general piece of advice as well, I should um, say if someone's new to wargaming things in general, is when it comes to basing these miniatures, especially with games where you have movement trays like this, um, basing is actually an extremely important part of it because it's essentially a frame for your army. Um, it's a unifying thing that um, like you can have all these different colour schemes from all these different heraldic schemes, especially if you're doing like Stark, for example. But if you base everything in the same way, so you have the same colours and the same layout, the same like grass tufts, things like that, then what it does is it keys everything together as one particular collection and it makes it look unified. And you'll find if you do all the bases different by comparison, then it looks a bit jarring. So I would certainly think about when you're making your collection of your particular army or whatever, keep that basing consistent across that force because it'll elevate it to a level much higher than you would otherwise suspect. It's um, Especially with the trays. Um, always base the trays the same way as your troopers too, so it all matches. But yeah, that's something as a last bit of parting advice I'd definitely recommend people think about. Uh, all right, let me just do uh well, thank you so much, guys, for coming on. And, uh, you know, Duncan, and, you know, you are definitely putting out such amazing work for A Song of Ice and Fire. I really find your tutorials helpful and, and all your tutorials because you can kind of I parse bits and pieces. I took some of your horse stuff for other miniature ranges to help me with my Targaryens as well. And Michael and Fabio, you know, the game is going strong and people jumping in. It's just so nice that you took the opportunity to be able to to come on and give a little bit of an overview for new people coming in to get us heading off strong into this new uh, updated version, the 2021 update for this year. I'm looking forward to where we're going with this. And uh, in the meantime, I hope everyone's able to get their miniatures on the table.